My name is Radek Szmuczyszyn, and I would like to say a few words about uh, what's new in Gradualizer, and I'm gradually typing Elixir and uh, Erlang. Uh, but first, oh, one, one or two words about me. So uh, I'm a tech lead at Erlang Solutions. Uh, I'm a static type system enthusiast. Um, I'm actually one of the Gradualizer core team members uh, for some time. And I'm also a co-creator of Gradient together with Przemek Wojtasik, who is uh, our colleague from the Erlang Solutions uh, office in Krakow. Um, I'm also a believer in good quality docs, so I'm one of the co-authors of uh, Erlang Enhancement Proposal 48, together with uh, Jose Valim and Eric Bailey uh, from the LFE community. And I'm also the implementer of uh, this, this specification, this uh, enhanced proposal in eDoc, which became part of OTP24. And thanks to that, we can generate XDoc documentation, so XDoc uh, static HTML uh, docs for, um, from Erlang projects. And uh, more professionally, I am an XMPP engineer. Uh, I have worked uh, for a number of years with uh, Mangus IM, which is our XMPP uh, server written in Erlang, which is uh, quite scalable, uh, reaching, well, depending on the Amazon node, uh, we choose to run it on or to test it on up to two million uh, concurrent connections. So not bad, I guess. And today I would like to demo uh, Gradient, uh, which is mostly a front-end to Gradualizer uh, for Elixir. So there are some hoops we have to jump when uh, we want to uh, use a tool uh, for Erlang with Elixir, but thanks to the same core representation, so the fact that both Elixir and Erlang compile to the same uh, abstract format, uh, we can do it. And Gradient is a tool that aims to, to like minimize the hassle, make, make the jumping the hoops as easy as possible. Um, but maybe also a word about um, static type checking first and gradual type checking. So uh, basically we have a, a distinction between uh, programming languages, between dynamically typed programming languages and statically typed programming languages. So dynamically typed programming languages are those where the invalid operations uh, are detected at runtime and they lead to runtime exceptions. So we write some code, uh, we have to run it, and if the code is buggy, we'll only know because a runtime exception is thrown. Uh, well, ideally in our tests, but sometimes in prod, in production. Um, statically typed programming languages are those where we just won't be able to compile like, some piece of code if it's buggy, where buggy is actually uh, depending on the type system used in a particular programming language. So the benefits are that we get the feedback earlier and uh, quite often we get very precise feedback about what's wrong and specifically where it's wrong in the program. So, um, having said that, let's just jump to the demo. Uh, okay, I hope the font is big enough. So, we'll work with that, but please let me know if it's, it's too small. Uh, on the left-hand side, I have an editor open with the um, demo server. Mm, on the right-hand side, I just have an Elixir shell open where we'll be uh, type-checking this. So maybe uh, let's start with, uh, with, with just that, uh, with uh, type-checking this file. And we got feedback that mm, it's okay. So uh, there are no type errors detected. And we actually don't have to run it. We just run the type-checker uh, on it. And what is the code about? So uh, quite often we uh, model our um, activities in uh, Elixir or Erlang applications as processes. And one of the most common patterns is, is to use a gen server. So it's basically the skeleton of a server 
uh, that we uh, fill in with the specific logic of our application. So the skeleton means that it will receive uh, messages, it will respond to these messages, and depending on the type of, um, well, the callbacks we implement, these might be synchronous messages or asynchronous messages. And uh, here in this uh, example server, we, uh, we declare the type of uh, the messages it's going to receive. So if you're familiar with Elm, for example, you might recognize the pattern that we uh, define an abstract data type with some variants. And every action that our code uh, does, or every action that somebody can um, like run on it from the outside, is declared by this uh, data type. In our case, uh, this is a contract about handling an echo request and a hello request, uh, which are defined in which are very trivial and defined in a module um, outside this this example. Um, so. Let's see what happens. Just, let's just see what happens when I change this uh, contract declaration to something like this. I will run the type checker again, and we get feedback that the clause on line 63 cannot be reached. So let's go there and see what's there. Here we have the standard uh, handle call, uh, which basically implements uh, the code for handling uh, one of the requests, the hello request. And uh, apparently, um, it cannot be reached. So this call will this code will never be called. It will never be used. So okay, let's fix that. Sorry. Uh, let's type check again. And good, fine, fixed. So let's uh, check another um, scenario. We go back to the full definition. So. Um, we have two types, uh, the echo request contract and the hello request uh, contract, but this time they are expanded, so I just don't use uh, references to external types, to remote types, I uh, use them in line. Let's see what happens now. And we get feedback that there are non-exhaustive patterns on line 58, so let's jump there and see what's going on. And this is our first clause of the handle call function. So uh, we get feedback that this function will be called with a value, with the example here on the right hand side, that's uh, a tagged tuple uh, with hello and some binary. And uh, we get feedback that uh, this function is expected to handle this, but it doesn't. So like we have missing implementation, like so, for example, we expect the server to do something, but we forget to write the implementation. And we get feedback about it before even running it. So, not bad. Um, at this point, what else can we get out of this? For example, or maybe not, maybe let me fix that uh, first before we proceed. So, uh, I implement the missing functionality, run the type checker again, okay, back to normal. So, so far so good. Uh, what else can we do with it? Can, can the type checker help us with something else uh, on the implementation side? So uh, let's try doing something like this. For example, I made a silly mistake when implementing this code. I uh, made a typo, so it's different than, than the protocol, than the declared uh, messaging interface. Uh, let's type check it now. And we got feedback that this pattern, echo rex, uh, on line 58, doesn't have the type message. Well, which, which is true, it doesn't have this type, because I made a, a stupid mistake when typing. So uh, let's also fix that. And back to normal. So what do we get from running this tool on our code? We uh, get dead code. Uh, elimination, or mm, we find that code. Uh, we find the code that's missing, so missing implementation, and we are also covered in case of uh, silly mistakes like typos and, and stuff. So, uh, sounds good to me. But what else can we use it for? For example, this was the, like, the core or the internals of the server. 
What about uh, the caller side? So the process that actually uh, sends a message to, to our server. Can, we, can this type checker help us uh, in any way on this side of, uh, of things, of the interface? So uh, let's imagine that um, similarly to the type of uh, requests, we could also define a type of the response. And for example, the response also might have different variants depending on uh, what's happening on the server side, for example, some internal state. So uh, we can define this uh, response to be of type contract hello uh, res, so uh, response. And if we do that, we also get this, the, the, the benefits of type checking on this side of thing, things, uh, on this side of the interface. So let's, let's for example, do something like this. Uh, again, do a silly mistake uh, in our hello function and type check that. And we get the feedback that the pattern OKZ is not of the type of the expected response, which is, again, uh, true. The thing here, though, is that specifying this type here is completely on us, like on, on me, the programmer. I cannot do a mistake here, because if I do, the type checker won't be able to help us. So we have to help it help us. And one more thing that's important, uh, why it's, it's the case, is that if we look uh, at the help of this function, we see that GenServer call actually returns term. And uh, term is the most general type in the entire type system. Like, it can be basically anything. That's why we have to provide this extra information um, here. Um, okay, so this syntax, though, might be a bit confusing. Uh, so the annotate type um, with the response type being passed as an argument. So uh, I was showing before, we can also uh, refactor it uh, similarly to how it's done with uh, the hello request, like this. This already feels more like uh, usual Elixir code. But if we still don't like it, uh, we can do something else. Uh, we can just uh, do, we can just define an auxiliary function called call echo. And in our case, it would look like this. Mm, and in this case, the information about this uh, type that we have to provide, so contract echo res, is uh, included in the spec file. So, mm, the gist of, of doing that is that we have to pass this information to the, to the type checker somehow, either through this annotation or through this uh, spec attribute, which is also a kind of annotation. The thing that happens at runtime, so gen server call, is ex exactly the same. And the annotate type uh, macro we, we see here uh, actually doesn't do anything at runtime. The only thing it does is it leaves information about this type in the abstract syntax tree of the program for the type checker. And uh, that's really it about the first uh, example. So I'm wondering if there is any question at this point. Okay, so I'll proceed uh, to the next one. So we could also ask ourselves the question, how else can we use the type checker? Uh, or how else can it help us? Uh, what else can it check before we run the program? So um, in an Elixir system, we uh, have these processes, but they are different. Like one process can handle messages of a certain type. Another process will handle messages of a different type. So one thing that we could do is uh, try to use the type checker to protect us from sending a, spe a specific kind of a message to a process that simply doesn't know it, doesn't understand it, cannot do anything useful with it. And uh, here we try to do something exactly like it. So first let's look at the test because 
uh, it will help us understand uh, what's going to happen and how to prevent it. So um, I would just run it. And in this case, it returned payload. Then I uncomment uh, a code that's uh, broken and run it again. And let's see what happens now. We see it's blocked. And we don't know why. And after a while, it timed out. So the gen server call timed out. Uh, so let's see what the test does to understand um, what happened. But it's important to know that it happened at runtime. We had to run it to, to actually get this error. So in the test, um, we start our server, uh, which, whose speed is stored under the variable SRV, and we also start uh, or spawn a completely different process that obviously will not handle the same messages as our server. And then when we use the API defined in our server's module with the server, it works. It returns payload. But when we use this API with some ordinary process, some random process, well, we saw what happened. It crashed at runtime after the timeout. So can we use the type checker to prevent something like this uh, from happening? Let's see. And indeed, when we type check this file, we get the feedback that on line 103, Um, the type that's expected is T, but we pass an ordinary PID, which basically means that we try to use the API of our specific server with a random process. And it's good, because this time we got this feedback just by running the type checker, not when running the code. So not in tests and not in prod, but ideally on, on our uh, working machine. So how is this achieved? Basically, similarly to the protocol that we declared in the previous example, we also declare the type. The type is just a T, as is uh, the usual convention. Uh, we define it to ultimately be a PID, but in this case, it's the PID of our specific uh, process, our specific server process. And later on, all the API functions that we call, instead of returning a PID, return our T type. So startling does it. Uh, echo function, the echo API function accepts that instead of a PID, and uh, basically all the all the public, all the exported functions do the same thing. And uh, thanks to that, it's impossible to misuse the API of this particular server with a different process because the T will be just a different type for every server that we uh, define, and. Again, one more benefit from uh, using the type checker on our code. So uh, any questions this far? I guess not. Uh, so let's uh, go to the last example, which is uh, stage four. And uh, let's go to the echo function and see what can we get uh, from using Elixir macros, a little bit of macro magic to make this even uh, more type safe. So in the first uh, example, we talked about the auxiliary function uh, called echo. And when I was showing uh, this demo to Robert Virding, he uh, immediately spotted that, but well, we have everything we need to actually generate this function. So we don't even have to write it ourselves. We can just... Uh, do something uh, smart to, to have, a gen have, a, sorry, have it generated uh, for us. And indeed, that's the case. So uh, in this example, we call this function, but we don't define it ourselves uh, anywhere. Uh, here, we have, um, here we have it commented out. It's exactly the same definition that is actually generated, but we don't have to write it ourselves. And let's see if it works. For example, if I do something like uh, this, just so that I'm not showing something uh, 
that's broken. Yeah, it detects the error. I fix the error. It compiles. Uh, no problems with that. Okay, so how do we achieve this generation? Uh, basically, on this side, so in the implementation, uh, we use something like typed server reply. Instead of using gen server reply or the return values from a handle call function, we explicitly call typed server reply. And one more thing that's a bit different from the previous example is that apart from uh, the value of the response, we also uh, provide the type of the response here. So uh, in the first example, we had to provide the type at the, let's say, call site where we were sending the message. And here, we provide this type uh, next to the actual uh, value. So the locality is uh, way bigger, is way better. It's harder to make a mistake uh, if we have the value and the type next to each other. And let's see uh, what happens if we, again, make a mistake in the value and it's not uh, what it should be. And in this case, actually because uh, we use this typed server reply uh, macro, we will also get feedback if these things don't match. So in the first example, it would be on us. If I made a, mer a mistake, well, I might figure out, the type checker might uh, find it, or it might not. In this case, uh, with this uh, auxiliary type server macro, uh, it's asserted that the value is actually of the type that we provide uh, later on. So let's fix that, type check again, and voila, it works. And uh, how does it work? Well, mm, to cut the long story short, uh, basically we, we use some uh, compile hooks that are defined by Elixir. Uh, Gradient provides um, implementation of these hooks and for as long as we use well-defined and a bit limited uh, request uh, data, like ecorec, or in general tagged tuples, and also we use uh, this macro for sending the responses, we will get these auxiliary functions generated. And uh, I think that's really all uh, I wanted to show um, as the demo. So, yeah, thanks for joining, thanks for listening.